The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten by the Polsky Family Supporting Foundation in partnership with the Johnson County Community College Foundation, which seeks to educate and empower the public in the areas of health, financial independence, and topical issues not covered elsewhere. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Johnson County Community College and welcome to the Polsky Theater. My name is Christy McWard. I am Director of Marketing and Event Management here at the college. And we are so pleased to have you here with us for tonight's Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series featuring Dr. Jeffrey Burns from the KU Alzheimer's Center. We have some regular Polsky patrons in the audience. I recognize some familiar faces, but for those of you who are new to the Polsky series, I do want to let you know that the Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series was founded in 1997. It was established and is underwritten by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation in partnership with the JCCC Foundation. And the series seeks to educate and empower the public in the areas of education, health and wellness, financial stability, and other issues not covered elsewhere. There's more information about the Polsky series in your packets. You should have received some, or maybe some couples received one, but there's some information about the Polskys and their contributions in your booklet, in your packet, as well as a copy of Dr. Burns' presentation. So you can take notes and, and refer to it later, because his presentation is packed full of great information for you tonight. I also want to tell you that in your, in your um, packet you have a green card and if you're new to the Polsky series and, we, and you're not receiving information from us, we'd love it if you would fill this out with your contact information um, so that we can let you know about upcoming events. Um, we'd also like to hear from you on what sorts of topics you'd like to have us present in the future. So we always try to mix it up at the Polsky series and bring a lot of value to you, but we like to have your input on that. So please um, fill these out and uh, hand them to the ushers and they'll give them to us at the end of the night. After Dr. Burns' presentation, he is going to be joined on stage by my colleague Penny Schaefer. Penny is the Director of Health and Human Services here at Johnson County Community College, and she is going to moderate a question and answer session with Dr. Burns using questions from you all. And to make sure that she can get as many questions in as possible, we'd like to ask you to write some of your questions on the blue cards. As you're listening to Dr. Burns and a question comes to mind, please write it on the card. Also hand this to one of our ushers and they will um, get it to us and we'll make sure Penny has it for her Q&A as well. Finally, I want to let you know that you can also watch past Polsky series lectures on our website and that website is www.jccc.edu slash Polsky series, and you can also find out more information about upcoming events as well there. Okay, let me bring out Dr. Burns. Let me introduce him for you. Dr. Jeffrey M. Burns is the Edward H. Hassinger Associate Professor of Neurology and the Associate Director of the KU Alzheimer's Disease Center. He also directs the Clinical and Translational Science Unit and is the Associate Director of the Heartland Unit for Neuroscience Trials. Dr. Burns graduated with a degree in English and Japanese from the University of Notre Dame and attended the University of Kansas School of Medicine. After medical school, Dr. Burns completed his residency in neurology at the University of Virginia, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Washington University in St. Louis. In 2009, Dr. Burns completed his Master's of Science in Clinical Research at the University of Kansas. Please help me give a warm welcome for Dr. Jeffrey Burns. All right, thank you, Christy, and thanks for organizing and inviting, inviting me back. It was two years ago when uh, I was first here, so it's great to be back, um, have such a great turnout uh, once again. So 
Um, so appreciate being here and having the opportunity to talk about uh, where we've been and where we're going in terms of Alzheimer's research uh, and where the field where the field is going. Um, so, uh, so basically, that's the theme I want to talk about: is where are we now and where are we going? And uh, and then look back a little bit over the last ten years in terms of what's changed. And in a lot of ways, we're in the same place um, that we were ten years ago. But you'll see, in a lot of ways, we've moved forward rapidly. And 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 I think uh, sort of the theme um, of the talk is is uh, you know we're at a, a important stage in terms of Alzheimer's disease research. It's really a hopeful time, and it's um, and I think over the next ten years we're going to see a lot of changes and uh, uh, a lot of major advances. And hopefully I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bring that out for you in terms of uh, where we're going. So, um, so before I start, I wanna, I wanna say, I wanna actually, looking back over the last 10 years, it's amazing to think how far we've come. And um, we've actually enrolled over 1,000 people into our, our studies. We've got a whole bunch of different studies that we've been putting on. And, and so it's really taken a big community effort um, to do what we're, what we're doing. And it will continue to take a huge community effort. And I want to point out three partners, community partners of ours, who are uh, organizations who see the value of what we've been doing in terms of our research and, and uh, have, have supported our research and our outreach to the community. Um, Village Shalom, Sertoma, which is a philanthropic organization in Kansas City, um, and then the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, have all supported our program and our community partners with our, with our program. So thanks to them and to the thousand volunteers who have participated in our studies. So, um, so where are we now in terms of our center? We are actually one of 29 Alzheimer's centers in the country, and these are nationally designated centers. Um, it's a very rigorous process to become one of these Alzheimer's centers. And this was our ultimate goal. When, when I joined KU 10 years ago, uh, my, my ultimate goal was to become one of these Alzheimer's centers. Um, it takes a huge amount of infrastructure and organization to do this. And we were able to bring together all the resources and all the investigators and put together a compelling application that in 2011 was funded. Um, and we became one of these 29. To get in, we had to knock somebody out. So it's it's kind of a cutthroat thing where you know you 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 really you really got it's a it's competitive. I'll say um, this is a big year for us because this is our first year where we're reapplying. Every five years, we have to basically get reelected as an Alzheimer's center, and so we're working hard. We're already working hard on our application, which will go in in October, November. We don't September, October, November. We haven't gotten the deadline yet, but. Uh, but it's it's something that we're working on, so uh, we're looking forward to the to the challenge. And we think what we've done um, with our center is is exciting, and we we are confident we'll be renewed as one of these centers. So, um, so you know, what is our our Alzheimer's center? Our mission is really focused on this: um, improving the lives of patients and families with Alzheimer's disease. And we want to do that by eliminating the disease through better treatments and prevention strategies. This has been our mission since day one, um, treatment and prevention. Um, when, and when we, when we said that 10 years ago, prevention, there weren't many people in the country or the world really talking about Alzheimer's prevention. And really, that's the big thing now. That's what everybody's talking about. And so we, we've uh, done a lot along those lines in terms of understanding what we can do to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And we really positioned ourselves, I think, very well to, to continue to contribute in, in that area. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is just a schematic that shows uh, how our center is organized. I'm not going to get too much into the details, but at the very center is our mission, what we're trying to do. Um, and around that mission, we've got different cores. We call them infrastructure that helps us do the research, which basically sits around that. We, we, and, and, and our care for patients with Alzheimer's disease. So we have a memory clinic where we see patients. We have a clinical trial unit, which uh, tests the latest drugs. We have an Alzheimer's treatment program where we're developing new drugs. We have our newer prevention program where we're trying to understand how do we prevent Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Then we have a number of different collaborations, uh, research projects and collaborations, and I'll touch on a couple of those. Um, that, that uh, we're working with investigators all over the country um, to uh, advance different, different themes and ideas and drugs. So, so that's sort of where we are now um, in terms of our center. But where are we in terms of understanding Alzheimer's disease? 
Um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about what is Alzheimer's disease and how do we diagnose it and how do we treat it. Um, so what is Alzheimer's disease? That's, uh, that, that hasn't changed a whole lot in terms of our understanding, unfortunately. We're, um, we still largely describe Alzheimer's disease. We know what it looks like. Um, we know we see early memory problems and uh, problems in the ability to organize and plan when somebody has Alzheimer's disease. We see that early on. We also know it's the most common cause of dementia, um, the most common cause of memory and thinking problems. Um, it accounts for about 50 to 70 percent of all dementia. And I'll talk a little bit more about what, what that means specifically in a minute. Um, we, uh, we know it's incredibly common. Over five million Americans have it. Turns out about one in eight people over the age of 65. So 10% or, or perhaps a little more um, over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease. And actually, if we look at even higher age group, 85 and older, it's somewhere around 40 to 50% in that population have Alzheimer's disease. So that's, so one out of three, maybe one out of two people over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's. So incredibly common. And it's incredibly costly. Um, this is the most expensive disease to the U.S. economy. Um, it's right up there, right up just above cancer and heart disease uh, uh, when we look at both the direct and indirect costs. So this is a, you know, a huge problem um, and it's only rising in its, uh, in, you know, in its degree of, uh, of difficulty, of, uh, if its impact. Um, you know, we, we have societal problem, we have, uh, we have an economic problem, and we have personal uh, uh, risk. So this is something that touches every aspect of our society and we need to do more about it. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. Um, here's some numbers, the prevalence, which I just mentioned. Um, 65 to 74, about 10% of people on the left. And we break it down here, the Alzheimer's Association put these numbers together uh, uh, to Caucasians, African Americans, or the purple line, and then, or the purple box, and then Hispanics. Uh, and you can see that, that the prevalence rises. 75 to 84, we see about a doubling. And then at the age of 85, in, uh, we see 40 to 50%. And the estimates in Hispanics and African Americans are much higher than Caucasians. Uh, close to 60% of African Americans and Hispanics, 85 and older, uh, are estimated to have Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so it hits some uh, ethnic populations, uh, uh, or racial populations, different than Caucasians, so something we really need to understand. Um, so incredibly common disease, big problem. Um, okay, so the number one question I get, and I've already gotten it tonight, is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And uh, the, the answer is dementia is a very broad term. Um, it's just a syndrome, and this is what the syndrome looks like. Gradual onset of memory problems, memory and thinking problems, that interfere with daily function. So they become severe enough that we're not able to do the things we've always uh, always done. So is, this is our criteria, what we're looking for when we're sitting in the clinic. Gradual onset, onset progressive decline in memory loss or other cognitive domains. We break cognition up, memory and thinking up into different things like visuospatial function, um, language, uh, memory, and planning and organizing or executive function. And then we, when we see enough of a problem where we're inter, we see interference with daily function, we call it dementia. Um, or, more simply, memory and thinking problems that interfere with our usual activities. So new problems interfering with usual activities. <laughs> dementia is a broad term, and it has a number of causes. Alzheimer's is a cause of dementia. Alzheimer's is the number one cause of dementia. So it's a specific uh, cause of a more you know, umbrella, generic uh, syndrome of memory and thinking problems that interfere with usual activities. So, um, so the, the difference is between Alzheimer's and dementia is Alzheimer's is a cause, dementia is sort of the broad syndrome, what it looks like uh, to a clinician. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of causes of dementia. Uh, the number one cause of dementia, as I mentioned, is Alzheimer's, but there are other causes. Parkinson's related dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies is the number two cause of dementia. Um, vascular or stroke-related dementia is the number three cause of dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is where we see problems in social behavior and uh, personality, language, um, and younger individuals, uh, usually before the age of 60, 
uh, frontotemporal dementia. And so that's, that's uh, the number four most common cause of dementia. So the point is there's lots of causes of dementia, but Alzheimer's is by far the most common. And, uh, and because of that, we often use the terms uh, interchangeably and create confusion. Um, although Alzheimer's is a more specific cause, uh, or is, is a specific cause of dementia. So now, how do we diagnose it? Um, the, the diagnosis, despite all the fancy stuff I'm going to show you um, and what you see in the newspapers, the diagnosis is still a low-tech diagnosis. The way we make the diagnosis is, is primarily by sitting down with family and talking to them and examining the patient. Um, and so the diagnosis really rests on what's been changing and how have things changed. What's the history? What's the characteristic of memory changes? What's the pattern been like? And we like to get the information from somebody who knows the patient well, um, a, a spouse or a child of, of the patient. They can tell us uh, with a little more uh, reliability what's been going on than the patient. You can imagine if a patient has memory problems, sometimes they forget they have memory problems. Um, and if somebody's real anxious, uh, maybe a little depressed or down, they might be reporting memory problems that don't necessarily, uh, don't necessarily signal the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And so it can, be, uh, it can be difficult if all we have is information from the patient. Um, that doesn't mean information from the patient isn't important. It is very important, but it's a little more reliable if we get it from a family member. So, uh, so really, the history rests on that information. Now, we do a physical exam. We will do brain scans um, or a brain scan. Uh, and we do it not necessarily to make a diagnosis. We do it to rule things out, like brain tumor, stroke, uh, other causes of dementia that can affect the structure of the brain. So we will get a brain scan, but we, you know, it's important. Uh, we don't make a diagnosis from the brain scan. We actually get the brain scan to make sure that other things aren't going on that might be causing the problems. And then we do a little bit of lab work. We usually check thyroid and vitamin B12 to make sure that uh, those, those aren't contributing to the problem. Um, so this is generally our, our evaluation. And if, if we get good information from somebody who knows the patient well, um, and, uh, and you know, brain scan doesn't show evidence of stroke, tumor, and the story is one that really fits early Alzheimer's disease, then usually that's enough to be confident that we, we have uh, early Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's a low-tech diagnosis. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are going in terms of our diagnosis, and we want to get, we want to get better. And I think we can with some of our new technology, but we're not quite there yet in using that technology. So, but here, here's some of the symptoms that we look for. Um, the, the things that we talk about when we're interviewing family um, is we're really focused in on memory changes and planning and organizing problems, or what we call executive function, um, or executive dysfunction, problems in planning and organizing. So the type of memory loss we see is not the memory loss that we have our whole lives. It's not the misplace our car keys and our glasses like we've always done. It's a new, pro it's a new level of problems um, for that individual. And that's why it's important to talk to somebody who knows the patient well. How have they changed? Are they forgetting conversations? Are they missing appointments? Are they forgetting to take their medicines? Are they forgetting names of people well known to them? Not their usual level of forgetting somebody's name. Um, so, you know, we're looking for a change. Um, are they repeating questions? Are they telling the same story over and over again? Some people have a habit of doing that their whole life. Uh, so when we see a new, new, new habit uh, develop, or uh, it's very common to have people wake up in the morning and ask, now, what are we doing today? Or what time is that doctor's appointment? And then 20 minutes later, same question over and over and over again. That's a strong sign of the memory loss that we see in early Alzheimer's disease. And then losing, so I got misplacing items here. This is a different level. So losing things that they never would have lost before. If it's a habitual problem, we get really worried that this is the, the type of memory loss that we see early in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, executive dysfunction is problems like managing the finances, uh, bringing all that information together and doing the right thing, writing the bill at the, or paying that bill at the right time. Driving, preparing meals, following recipes is a, is a great example of an executive function task. And then operating things like the microwave. Uh, uh, takes a little bit of executive function. And so we, we actually spend a lot of time in our clinic talking about these kinds of things uh, because this is really where, where the, 
the diagnosis uh, rests on this type of information, not fancy scans and uh, blood tests and skin tests and all that that you'll, you'll see in the newspaper. Um, we do do a little bit of memory and thinking testing. We like to corroborate what we're seeing um, uh, or what we're hearing, the story that we're hearing. We like to do a little bit of testing and kind of see uh, that we're, that we're um, you know, seeing the same kind of changes on our, on our cognitive tests. Um, this is, uh, I like to show this because it really shows an interesting example of how somebody who developed, who started normal in a research program without any memory and thinking problems, but developed Alzheimer's during the course of being followed in this program, and over 15 years, just the, the, their ability to draw a clock fell, fell apart. Um, they were diagnosed after seven years um, with Alzheimer's disease. So here is the clock that was drawn the year this individual was diagnosed um, with Alzheimer's disease based on the history. The family was noticing changes and the clinician was able to key in on those changes and make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see the clock is, is really perfect in that, um, in that evaluation. Uh, it was really not until three years after this individual was repeatedly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease that we started to see problems in the test. And then four years later, uh, we see big problems. So it, um, they left the 12 out, and they weren't able to write the correct time on the clock, 2.45. Um, so the point I like to make here is if we were not listening to the family, if we were relying just on this test, um, which this is a test that's touted as a screen, a way for a clinician to you know, give the test, don't worry about memory and thinking unless there's a problem on this test. That's what a screen is. It's supposed to trigger a further evaluation. But if we relied on this for this individual, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have picked up dementia or Alzheimer's until four years after he was already diagnosed. So these aren't sensitive tests. For the most part, all the tests that we have tend to be insensitive to these early changes that we can pick up by a family member. So, um, so uh, it's important to listen to the family. Is uh, is the bottom line. So. Um, now, families, we don't always have a good source of information. Sons tend to be kind of poor on the, uh, on the information that they provide. Daughters are great. So I'm happy I've got five daughters. My mom and dad only have three sons, and so they're, they're in for trouble. But um, Okay, so when is it? Well, here's the second most common question uh, that I get is, when is it aging and when is it Alzheimer's? Um, and really it comes down to, when we see those functional problems, that, 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 that difficulty with uh, doing the things that somebody's always done, the usual activities. With age-related cognitive changes, we don't see that. Uh, we might see things slow down a little bit, uh, but we don't tend to see uh, problems arise. Um, so we, we know memory and thinking change as we get older, just like our speed, our ability to run changes, and our ability to lift weights changes as we get older. You know, our brain is a little bit slower at pulling information out of the memory banks, a little bit slower retrieval. That tip of the tongue syndrome that we always get, that we all get, uh, uh, the ability to come up with that word, that name, uh, that restaurant name or whatever, that movie star name, um, gets, it, it gets harder as we get older, uh, a little bit slower. Um, we see declines in working memory, so the ability to hold a little bit of information in the memory banks and act on it. So look up the phone number and then walk across the room and dial it which we don't have to do anymore, but uh, that's working memory. And then our processing speed slows down uh, as we get older. And these are measurable thing, things that we, we can see in, in, the, in the lab. Uh, but these types of changes really don't interfere uh, on, a, on a, a significant level with, the, uh, with an individual's ability to do their daily activities. Um, and that's the difference. So when we start seeing new problems arising, family starts noticing new problems, um, then we, we, we get worried about uh, early Alzheimer's disease. So I like to tell this story about uh, the first patient who we know had Alzheimer's disease, uh, August D, whose doctor was Dr. Alzheimer. Uh, so she was in her 50s um, in this picture in the hospital with Dr. Alzheimer. And he, uh, her husband had taken her to the insane asylum. It was the only thing he could do with her. Um, she couldn't live at home. She was getting agitated and violent towards her husband and couldn't do anything uh, to care for herself or, or help around the house anymore. And her husband had no options, took her to the, took her to the insane asylum, and she was 
violent and agitated and accusing him of infidelities and accusing a neighbor woman of infidelities as well. And so he took her to the hospital and Dr. Alzheimer saw her and he noted her memory problems and her behavioral problems and uh, followed her for four years. And I think it was about 1904 or 1905, she died. And this is brain tissue from, from her, uh, from Auguste, under the microscope. So we're looking at uh, small sections of brain tissue stained in a certain way um, that Dr. Alzheimer, he was a pathologist, he was very good at studying the brain under the microscope, and he found all these abnormalities, all this dark material that we can see um, is, uh, is abnormal. Um, he called them plaques, and then on the right, we're zoomed in on brain cells, and they're, they're filled with uh, tangles, tangle material, which we now know as tau. Um, so he, Dr. Alzheimer described this, these changes in her brain and, and reported that you know, her higher order cognitive problems, her memory problems and behavioral problems were, were related to this disease, these changes in the brain. It was a really uh, relatively new idea to say that these sort of psychiatric issues were brain disease. Um, and over the next 15, 20 years, the disease took his name as Alzheimer's disease. What's most interesting about the story is after she died, it wasn't long before her husband married that neighbor woman. <laughs> so she was, there was, she was still working a little bit. So, um, so that's, that's the first case of Alzheimer's. Now we, you know, over the years we think about, we now think about Alzheimer's as plaque and tangle pathology, brain changes of plaques and tangles in the brain. We've been thinking about it as, as that for 100 years, the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease. The big question we'll talk about in a bit is what causes the disease? Is it the plaques? Is it the tangles? Is it something else? And we still don't know. Um, so we've been describing the disease as plaque and tangle pathology and possibly related to plaques, um, uh, but we, we don't know. Actually, 10 years ago, uh, people were far more certain they knew the cause of Alzheimer's disease as plaque, amyloid plaque related. Uh, we have much more uncertainty about, about that now, and I'll show you some reasons why. Um, so, uh, so I'll come back to that. So in terms of treatment, where are we in terms of treatment? Um, I th I, I, Alzheimer's is a treatable disease. We have, we have drugs that can help. Um, so uh, we don't have drugs that can cure it. We don't have drugs that can stop it. Um, we don't have drugs that we consider disease modifying that stop the disease process. That's what we want, disease-modifying drugs. But we do have drugs that can help. Um, and we have two classes of drugs. We have the cholinesterase inhibitors. The most common one is Dinepazil or Aricept. Um, it's been around for probably 25 years. And then we have the NMDA antagonist, Memantine or Namenda. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's about 10 years, been around for about 10 years. So we have two classes of drugs that have been shown to be helpful for Alzheimer's disease. What's their effect? Well, their effect is one. We'd, we'd love to see a better effect than this. It's one of, of slowing the decline, of actually leveling out um, uh, changes in memory and thinking. So it, if somebody's testing at a certain level on their cognitive tests, they tend to stay where they are for about a year on that medication, uh, on, on one of these cholinesterase inhibitors. After a year, we see less decline in their memory and thinking testing uh, than if they weren't treated. Um, so we see a, uh, basically a slowing of the symptomatic decline, the symptoms of cognitive changes in Alzheimer's disease. You know, what we don't see here is a big increase. We don't even see it. We really don't expect an increase in cognitive testing. Um, we, we tend to see a flattening uh, of, of decline. So uh, I draw this for everybody I prescribe uh, a cholinesterase inhibitor to because I don't want them to go home and think that in a month, you know, they're going to be a lot better because a lot of people will stop it if we do that. We, the, the effects of the, these medications are one that we sort of accumulate over time by getting more stability um, over time in their cognitive testing. So it's not one where we see a big boost in performance. So uh, Namenda works in much the same way. Now, we, we start Namenda, tend to start Namenda in the moderate to severe stages of Alzheimer's disease. So as the disease progresses, we'll add it on to the cholinesterase inhibitor. So we use two drugs in the later stages uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so a cholinesterase inhibitor like Aricept and then Namenda 
we add on to that. So two drugs are better than one in those later stages. Um, so, you know, what we need, again, we don't have drugs that are, that are stopping this yet. We don't have drugs that are reversing it. We don't have drugs that are really having a big impact on cognition. We just tend to have some that help with the symptoms. Where we want to be is disease-modifying medications. So, so where are we now? We're still, we're, you know, we're, we're at, there, I think there's two key things. Number one, we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease accurately, and we can diagnose it early in life. Um, we can't diagnose it definitively, because really to be definite about it, we need to see brain tissue under the microscope and see the plaques and tangles that we use to define the disease. But we are very good at diagnosing it early and accurately. Um, we're probably right 85 to 90 percent of the time. Um, when we're wrong, it's usually a cousin of Alzheimer's disease, like one of the, one of the diseases I mentioned earlier, dementia with Lewy bodies, perhaps vascular dementia, um, or a, a, a frontotemporal dementia variant. So, but we can diagnose Alzheimer's accurately and early, and then Alzheimer's is treatable. Um, again, it's not curable, but it's treatable. These, we have drugs, and they're helpful. Um, so one of the things we've done in the last 10 years is really establish our memory care clinic. Um, we are proud of uh, what we've grown to be. You know, so 10 years ago, it was, it was just me. Now we have five physicians and two nurse practitioners, and we see a lot of patients uh, with memory problems. Um, and this is, you know, that we call it clinic. This is where we're caring for patients. We're not doing research. We're basically caring for people with memory problems by diagnosing and treating. Uh, um, so we've become pretty well known, I think, in the area for for being the specialist in terms of memory care. So we're, we're proud of that. So, so now where are we going? And this is where the research comes in. Where are we going? Here's where I think we're going. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you why I think that. But where we're headed is uh, diagnosing Alzheimer's and cognitive issues before the onset of symptoms. We think that in the next five, 10 years, we will be able to see the changes. We can see them now, as I'm gonna show you. See the changes related to Alzheimer's disease before there are any symptoms. Um, where we need to be, though, is be able to do something with that information, something effective with that information. We need to be able to halt the disease or reverse it when we're, when we're seeing those changes. And that's what we're working on. We're working on trying to find ways to stop the disease or, or reverse it. Um, so here's a modern day picture of the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease. Um, you can see the plaques are the large clumps, sort of. Uh, loose clumps of dark material, and then the brain cells are sort of the flame shape towards the bottom. Those are brain cells filled with tau tangles. This is what we see under the microscope uh, in people with Alzheimer's disease. As we see those plaques and tangles develop, we see changes in the brain, uh, shrinkage of the brain. And here's a, I'm going to give you an example over two years of how one individual's brain changed as their Alzheimer's disease progressed. So we're looking at the brain here looking straight on the, at the patient about halfway through the brain. Um, so they'd be facing us and we're about halfway through the brain. And watch the middle, the dark area in the middle, that's basically space, normal space. It's called a ventricle, it's filled with fluid. And as the brain shrinks, we see an expansion of that space. We see the loss of brain tissue and an expansion of that space. And you can see also in other areas of the brain, there's shrinkage over two years. Um, so now I want to also call your attention to the memory center, the hippocampus. So I got arrows pointing at the hippocampus, not the dark area, but just next to the dark area is the hippocampus. This is the short-term memory center of the brain. This is the part of the brain that takes information and puts it up into the memory banks for us to pull it down later. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, this area gets hit hard. Um, and as, you, you, as I'll show you here, I'm going to move forward two years. Watch that brain tissue in that area. We see a big loss of hippocampal volume. So the short-term memory is hit hard because this part of the brain is really uh, hit hard in, um, in early Alzheimer's disease. And so the ability to write down that new information and put it into the memory banks uh, becomes far less efficient than it once was. And that's why the it, you know, old information that's been successfully put into the memory banks, we can draw on that information. But what happened yesterday or last week isn't getting put into the memory banks, and, and that's why an individual will have short-term memory problems, while long-term memories are generally preserved um, early in the disease. So those are the type of changes that we can see in the brain. We use these 
changes. We can measure these changes in, the, in, our, in our lab and using computers. Uh, and someday, I think in the next three to five years, we're going to be using this type of information to help us diagnose uh, individuals more accurately. So we can uh, get this kind of information and use it to help us make the diagnosis. We call that a biomarker of the disease, a biological marker of the disease. And so we're really entering the era of Alzheimer's biomarkers. Um, these are uh, our ability to see the signature of Alzheimer's in the brain for, uh, pe in people with, with Alzheimer's disease, and as I'll talk about, potentially as a way to, to, uh, to uh, see the changes in the years prior to the onset of Alzheimer's disease. But Alzheimer's biomarkers either reflect the pathology, the amyloid or the tau, uh, or they re reflect consequences of the disease, the brain shrinkage or the metabolic changes um, or the disruption of the way the brain works. Um, and we're trying to use Alzheimer's biomarkers to, to be better at diagnosing, to be better at predicting the future, what's going to happen, um, and then to screen individuals uh, for, for uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease. So the most exciting uh, part of uh, you know, the Alzheimer's field is really in this area we call molecular imaging. So for the last 100 years, we've, looked, we've had to look at the brain under the microscope to see if, you know, if there are plaques and tangles present. We had to wait until somebody dies, do a brain autopsy, and look at the brain under the microscope. The only way we could see plaques and tangles. So up until uh, really in the last uh, four to five years. So what's been developed in the last decade um, and now is in use uh, in the last four to five years around the country is the ability to actually see plaques and tangles uh, in the brain um, in life. And so the way this works is we are able to inject a radio label, a basically a dye that crosses into the brain and, and is designed to stick to amyloid or tau, um, the tangles. And it emits a signal. There's a little, actually sticks to that, that the, the amyloid plaques or the tau, and it emits a signal. This, uh, this tip here emits a signal that the PET scanner can pick up. Um, and with that information, we can actually see if somebody has an elevation of amyloid or is not elevated with amyloid. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, we have basically, we have new vision into the brain. Um, and, and this is the kind of uh, you know, advance that's really going to change, I think, over the next five to eight years, uh, how we diagnose Alzheimer's disease. We can do this now. It's FDA approved. The big hang up now is proven how useful it is. So we cannot get this kind of a test uh, reimbursed, paid for, by um, insurance companies or Medicare. It costs about $5,000, and, uh, and they rightfully, I think, not complaining, but they, they uh, don't really see the evidence that this type of a scan changes how we care for the patients or changes the outcomes for the patients. And so and they, they're really waiting for evidence to be developed um, to show that this kind of information is going to change the way the physicians operate, um, the way they treat patients, and then the outcomes for the patients. So we have studies ongoing trying to show this kind of information is useful. It would help patients, and, and I think over the next few years we'll develop that evidence base, and these kinds of scans will become, uh, will become common. Um, what's really exciting, so this is an amyloid scan. We've been doing amyloid scans for about uh, probably three years at at KU. Um, we just last week did our very first uh, tau tangle scan, our tau PET scan. So literally probably six days ago, um, I was over in the radiology department and, and we scanned an individual um, through a research study. This is only uh, uh, something we can do in, in the research setting. It's not something that's available in the clinics, but um, here we're looking at a, another brain where we're looking uh, face on with an individual. I'm going to overlay the tau scan that we got on, on the individual. And we see really, this is, to me, I, I walked in the day after and the first thing I did was go look at the scan and I saw this and this is probably the most exciting thing I've seen in 10 years. Uh, can you tell? Uh, so, I mean, this is amazing. This is exactly where we expect to see the tau tangles. Um, and so this, for me, is the first time we've been able to see into the brain of a living individual and see these tau tangles. Um, so this is really, this is something where if we combine this with the amyloid, we're actually seeing what the pathologists see, what Dr. Alzheimer saw 100 years ago in life. 
That's gonna, I think, over the next five to 10 years, really change the way we operate and change the way we actually can predict who's going to develop problems or who's at higher risk for developing the problems. So, um, so this is an amazing scan. And so we're, that's sort of our next phase of research is try to get, get more of this. Uh, now, again, the problem is these, these cost a lot of money, four, four to $5,000. When we do them in research, we have to find that money to do these scans. So, um, so really, probably the next year or two, we're going to be working hard to find money to do to, to develop research projects, so we can we can look into these tau tangles and how they change. So, uh, where we're most excited to use these types of scans is is here. Is and can we use these scans to detect Alzheimer's before the onset of symptoms? This is an individual who had elevated amyloid in their brain. They had evidence of the amyloid buildup, the plaque buildup in their brain, but they were totally normal. Turns out one out of three people over the age of 65 have amyloid um, in their brain. This in, for this individual, it meant that they were on the trajectory towards Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so we think for some individuals, uh, we can detect the changes of Alzheimer's before the onset of symptoms. Now, um, one out of three people uh, have this brain amyloid, and we, we also know that not everybody who has amyloid goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease. But although people with amyloid in their brain do, pr do eventually develop Alzheimer's at a higher rate, not, a, not even close to 100%, but at a higher rate than individuals without amyloid. So it's not a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease if somebody's cognitively normal and has brain amyloid, um, and not everybody will ultimately develop Alzheimer's disease, but it is a risk factor. Um, means somebody's risk is, is, is higher uh, when we see this. Uh, that risk, we think, is spread out over 10 to 20 years. We think that, that the changes of amyloid buildup in the brain uh, begins 10 to 20 years before the onset of symptoms. And so we're trying to use this information to identify people at higher risk and then do something about it. So um, but the big question is, does amyloid cause the disease? We've really focused on amyloid over the last, uh, really, hundred years, really over the last 30 years, intensely, where amyloid was considered the cause of Alzheimer's disease um, by a lot of people. And be, with that model in mind, a lot of different techniques have been de developed to try to treat amyloid, try to, get, try to block it from building up in the first place, try to pull it out of the brain if it's present, or block any toxic effects it might have on the brain cells. Um, and really, over the last 10 years, we have conducted a large number of studies test in this hypothesis, and we have a large number ongoing right now. Um, the big question, though, is, is amyloid the smoke or the fire? And we still don't know. If it's the fire and we put it out, we can cure the disease. If it's just the smoke, if it's a byproduct of something else, then treating it, you know, may not help. Uh, and it may not help, certainly won't help everyone, um, and it may not have as big of an impact as we, as we would hope if we were able to do something about the amyloid. So we have established uh, a clinical trial unit. There's a group of individuals, team of physicians, coordinators, and research assistants who are working together to, to test the latest drugs, um, to test the cutting edge clinical trials. It takes a big team to do this. And we have ongoing trials testing you know, the anti-amyloid uh, techniques if we block amyloid or pull it out of the brain. Uh, we're also testing intranasal insulin right now squirting insulin into the nose and it actually gets into the brain and may have a, uh, an, a, a good effect on the brain. Neuroprotective uh, agents, agents that can, can increase the health of the brain cells. And then we have some metabolic uh, interventions as I'll talk about. Um, so over the last eight years or so, we've been testing this amyloid hypothesis directly in people by uh, using medications that actually can reduce in this case, it redu reduced the buildup of, of amyloid in the brain in, in a group of individuals over about a year and a half. Um, and so we've sort of proven this concept that we can do something about amyloid in the brain. But the big question is, as it is, does that help the patient? Um, and the answer has been, unfortunately, a series of trial failures is what they end up being called, trial failures. Um, they're a big disappointment but they're really not a failure. I mean, these are very good studies that test a very smart idea, but they don't work for the patient. Um, and we've had, this is five, there's a, there's a few more now added to the list, um, where testing this amyloid idea, if we do something about amyloid, does it help the patient? So far, the patients haven't improved. 
Um, they've continued either the way we expected with that drug, at the same, they've declined at the same rate as people on, on the placebo, or in one case, they actually got a little bit worse. Um, so why is this not a failure? Well, it's not a failure because we're testing this idea and we're using that information and we're still moving forward. Um, what we've done is, you know, now the, the focus over the last 30 years has really been amyloid. Amyloid, amyloid, amyloid. And some of us haven't been huge amyloid fans. Our center is really focused more on alternative uh, strategies. And what this does for the field is actually energizes the search for other causes. So we're, we're seeing more and more focus on the tau, the tangles, especially now that we can see tau. We're going to see a huge effort at, at interfering with that buildup of tau. Genetics, vascular changes, the blood flow changes. We see blood flow changes in people with Alzheimer's disease and metabolism. The brain cells uh, slow down. The metabolism of the brain cells changes. Um, and really, our focus is, is this, metabolism um, at the Alzheimer's Disease Center. We're studying insulin resistance. We're studying mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell. They generate the energy for the cells. Um, and, and that's our focus, as I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. So this is a slide from Dr. Swordlow. So Dr. Swordlow and I direct the, the overall Alzheimer's Center. And he, he uh, likes to make the point that, OK, over time, we have our fancy car. And as we get older, you know, we get some dents and scratches. Um, our engine, this is a mitochondria. I'm sure you remember from biology. Um, our engines also slow down a little bit. Now, if we want to impact the car the best, uh, do we go after the scratches and dents? Yeah, we might, but that's really not going to help, help the car so much. We really need to focus on the engine, try to rev the engine a little bit. And so our goal is really, let's focus on the engine. Let's focus on the me metabolism and the, the, the heart of metabolism in the cells um, and try to fix the metabolism, fix the engine. Now, how do we do that? Well, this also is from Dr. Swerdlow. Uh, and we do it by impacting metabolism. And so Dr. Swerdlow uh, works in a lab and has an incredible understanding of metabolism. Um, this is his figure. These are the kinds of things Russ thinks about all day long, and he thinks about how can we impact this, uh, this, this circuit, this cycle of uh, activity. Um, and, we're, you know, and so he has ideas, he's got compounds, and we're actually doing this now in mice and in, in men. Uh, uh, so, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that right, right here. So we are trying to rev the engine. We're trying to rev up the engine by studying metabolism. Now, how do we impact metabolism? We can do it with drugs. We can also do it with diet, and we can do it with exercise. Hence our interest, we have a strong interest in exercise, uh, primarily because of its impact on metabolism. We have some drugs that actually impact that last figure, that impact, they, they uh, increase activity in certain metabolic pathways. OAA is something that we're testing, and then s which is a sort of related to estrogen, um, we're testing that. We're also testing a diet, a uh, ketogenic diet, which is kind of like an Atkins diet, where we're, instead of using a lot of glucose, a lot of sugars, we're actually using a lot of fats, trying to replace the sugars with things like ketones, which we think is a, an alternative fuel supply for the brain that can sort of rev up, uh, rev up the activity of the brain. And so we're, we're now actually testing these, these ideas in people. Russ also tests them in his lab in mice. And this is an example, basically, the more green, the better. On the left, we've, we've given the mice placebo, uh, uh, so fake drug. Um, you might think that's funny. We have to use placebo in mice uh, to fake them out, but uh, we do it more for ourselves. But give the mice placebos, and then we give the others a dose of OAA, this oxaloacetate. And actually, what Russ found is uh, that the, the, uh, there were more brain cells being, being born, basically, in the mice that were being given this OAA. Um, so what we're doing now is we're actually starting to try this OAA out in people. Um, two grams per kilogram is how much we gave the mice. We can't give that much to people because that, that, would, that, would, that would take a little bit too much. So we're testing, we're actually right now trying to find the right dose uh, and then we're going to test at the right dose can we see an impact on the brain. And so it's a big process where we're just basically taking, you know, baby steps, uh, but working towards the big goal of trying to find ways to stimulate new neuron growth and stimulate, you know, brain health. Um, this is what we call our Alzheimer's treatment program, which is really Dr. Swerdlow's program where he's developing new drugs, new treatment strategies. 
and our unique twist is how do we impact metabolism? And we're, you know, through this, this uh, our larger efforts uh, and our clinical trials, we're able to test, you know, take these drugs from, from the lab and, and, and translate them into the patients. Um, and now we're trying to prove that they have the, the effect that we, we hope they have. Um, so, so that's treatment. So we're focused on metabolism. Uh, the, the rest of the world is really focused heavily on amyloid and starting to focus on tau. And, uh, and, but our unique twist is how do we impact metabolism? The other unique thing that we're doing is, you know, and now most centers are, are focusing on this, is can we prevent Alzheimer's disease? What can we do to prevent Alzheimer's disease? Uh, that's the big question. Um, in 2010, the NIH did a, put a panel together and reviewed all the evidence of, of, uh, for, for Alzheimer's prevention and found uh, what we knew uh, uh, was that there's really not enough evidence to say definitively we can prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, so they basically said there's insufficient evidence to support the broad use of, of uh, uh, interventions to prevent dementia and that we need large-scale trials to build that evidence base. We need to do it in a randomized clinical trial, real rigorous uh, fashion. Uh, now the press took this and said there's nothing you can do to prevent Alzheimer's disease, which is really over-interpreting what, what, what's, what's said here. We actually think we can prevent Alzheimer's disease. And when we talk about prevention, we're thinking more about delaying the onset. We think we can delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. We think we can push it back in time uh, in an individual. We just haven't proven it yet. And we need more money and support to, to do those studies. Um, so why do we think we can prevent Alzheimer's? Really because the major risk factors, besides the biggest ones are age and genetics, um, are the biggest, strongest risk factors. But the, the other risk factors, tend to be modifiable. They tend to be things that we can do something about. So uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, stroke risk um, and stroke, diabetes, obesity. Uh, these are things we can, we, can, you know, we can do something about. And these are the major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. There are also protective factors in education, keeping our mind active, going to lectures um, on a, at, at night, uh, getting a little brain activity. Um, and then exercising, physical exercise. These are things that, that appear to protect against um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. They appear to lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of data suggests that these type of modifiable risk factors, cardiac risk factors, um, are, uh, ha have a role in, in Alzheimer's prevention. So we're setting out now to trying to prove that we can do something about this. Um, one of the basically first things that we did is uh, is, is investigate this. How, how do things like how fit we are, our, what we call our aerobic capacity, um, how much work we can do on a treadmill. If we put somebody on a treadmill, how much work can they actually do? It's a reflection of how active they are and how fit, how fit their heart and lungs are. We measured in a, uh, we've measured in probably four to 500 individuals with and without Alzheimer's disease, this aerobic capacity. And we've looked at how it relates to the brain. Um, and, and brain shrinkage, in particular in people with Alzheimer's disease. And this, these figures show uh, that what we found in people with Alzheimer's disease was that those who have a higher fitness level, those who have a higher aerobic capacity, um, have much less brain atrophy than those who have a very low fitness level. And that atrophy, that shrinkage, tends to be in the hippocampus, that memory center, and the parietal region, which is organizing and planning. Um, so this suggests, doesn't prove, but it suggests that, um, that, ec that physical activity to boost fitness may slow, may modify this disease process. Um, so we think exercise, physical exercise, is medicine. We think it's something that we can use to help us prevent or delay the onset of cognitive problems and Alzheimer's disease. And we also think that it's something that's useful for people with memory problems. Um, and so now we're doing rigorous, randomized trials uh, to try to understand this better and prove it. Um, we're trying to understand what's the right dose and can we use it to prevent um, the, the Alzheimer's disease and people at higher risk for developing the disease. So let me show you, uh, okay, so you know, why'd the NIH say we, we, there's not enough evidence? Really because that direct evidence, that randomized controlled trial data that we need to prove it uh, is, is lacking. We just don't have much direct evidence. It comes from these big observational studies 
um, that uh, don't allow us to answer this question. We, we actually don't know, we, we, we can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt whether exercise makes us smarter or more smart people exercise. Um, <laughs> we call that reverse causation. So is it the exercise making us smarter or when we measure this in a big group of people, is it the smarter people who are exercising? That's hard, to, it's actually very hard to pull those things apart unless we do a randomized controlled trial. So um, that's why we're doing the studies that we're doing. So our first Alzheimer's disease exercise program trial where we put, uh, we, we, we took uh, 80 people with Alzheimer's disease and put half in the, an aerobic exercise group and half in a non-aerobic exercise group. And we're studying if we influence that fitness level, that aerobic capacity, does it impact the brain? Our early results are uh, pretty impressive. The numbers maybe won't look that impressive. The lines don't maybe look that impressive to you. They're impressive to us. Uh, we're actually seeing in the first 43 individuals in this study, we're seeing less shrinkage of the hippocampus, less shrinkage in the, uh, that memory center in those that are aerobically exercising. Um, so this imply, or this demonstrates, if this holds up in our full sample, um, this would really show that aerobic exercise slows the disease process, which when we talked about the drugs, we don't have drugs that slow the disease process. We spend billions on drugs. Exercise, a simple intervention of exercise may actually do this. Um, so this is just a fancy picture. We're also looking at, we can map uh, the white matter, the tracks of the white matter. So these are all uh, uh, fibers, white matter fibers coursing through the brain and interconnecting and we're looking, does exercise have an impact on, on the white matter structure of the brain as well right now? So uh, we'll, we'll know more soon. The other study that we did is, was called our team study and this is for individuals without memory problems. So individual, cognitively normal individuals and we're asking what's the right dose? Um, the, the recommended amount of exercise is 150 minutes um, uh, a week, so 30 minutes, five days a week. That's what uh, all the major agencies want us to do, 150 minutes a week. We tested the idea, it is a little enough and is more better. Pretty simple idea. Um, what we found was, yes, uh, we think some is better than none um, and uh, more is better. What we found was that aerobic capacity went up the way we expected it. The more exercise we do, the better off we are in terms of our aerobic capacity. Uh, but as that aerobic capacity changed, we saw benefits in, uh, in cognition, greater benefits in cognition in one area, visuospatial function. Um, for everybody, we saw benefits in an area of cognition of attention, so everybody who exercised. So, um, so basically, bottom line is, uh, I don't wanna get too, too complicated, but this is the bottom line, the common sense, any is better than none, and more is better than some. So, but the, the key message is any is better than none. We think it's, it's way more important that you get some exercise than you hit a threshold of say 150 minutes a week. Um, there are benefits of, from going from zero to some. And so, you know, that's the, first, that's the first challenge. Get to some, and then once you get to some, try to get to, try to, get to the goals that we set, 150 minutes a week, so. Um, so really to sum up our research and exercise, our studies suggest that exercise may slow Alzheimer's disease. It may actually modify the disease. And this aerobic capacity, if, when we're exercising, we should be trying to boost our aerobic capacity. Um, and we, we do that really by basically walking. Walking on a treadmill, give it some intensity and your aerobic capacity will, will rise. Um, or get a trainer um, and they can help you. So, uh, but we still need a lot more data. We still need a lot more studies. We need to really, we still need to prove, I think, beyond a doubt that, that uh, exercise and the different types of exercise provide brain benefits. We need to understand how big those effects are and then we need to understand why it happens. Um, if we can understand those mechanisms, then we can design better ways to prevent and, uh, Alzheimer's, better ways to use exercise to fight Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so we've developed, uh, just in, in 2012, after a couple years of hard work, we launched our Alzheimer's prevention program um, in 2012, and really to set the stage for us uh, for this new era of prevention trials. With these new technologies to image the brain, we knew we were gonna have opportunities to see these changes of risk of, for Alzheimer's disease and then test prevention strategies. 
test things like exercise, test things like anti-amyloid strategies. Um, and so we've set that stage, and we're actually doing the very first trial of its kind in the world. Uh, we call it our APEX trial, our Alzheimer's Prevention Program Exercise Trial, where we are looking for individuals, we're scanning individuals, uh, looking for amyloid. If they have amyloid, no memory problems, they have amyloid. Uh, we consider that higher risk, and then we put them into a one-year exercise program to see does exercise impact the brain? How does it impact the brain, the amyloid, the, the uh, structural changes of the brain, and then memory and thinking processes. So we launched this trial um, about a year ago. Um, so again, does one year of aerobic exercise reduce the amyloid, slow the shrinkage, and improve memory and thinking? And we need participants. We've got about, we've, we've screened about 85, 90 people on the way to 400, um, and enrolled about 20 people on our way to 100. So we're really early in this process of uh, identifying individuals and then exercising them for a year. So we're looking for more participants. Um, the other trial that we're doing that the Alzheimer's Prevention Program is participating in is a national collaboration called the A4 study, which is testing one of these anti-amyloid drugs, one of these drugs that pulls amyloid out of the brain. It's a very large national trial um, looking for the same type of individuals, individuals who have normal memory and thinking but have amyloid uh, on their PET scan. Um, this study is looking for really 4,000 individuals who get the scan to find 1,000 who enter the three-year anti-amyloid study. Um, really, it's an this is an amazing study, huge study, uh, and really the whole country, academic uh, uh, um, uh, centers all around the country are participating in this trial. We've been involved since our study. We've, we've worked closely with the A4 team to help with uh, different angles that we've already got experience doing, and the study was launched probably six months ago. Um, I want to show, they got a great video, uh, and I want to show this video. It's about, it's a three-minute video um, about the A4 study, and it includes four people that we work with, um, including the head of the study, Reza Sperling, and then a guy named Josh Grill, who we're very good friends with. Um, so we're working closely with these guys, and this is just great video, inspiring video that I want to show. I absolutely believe that Alzheimer's disease is preventable. I've been very involved in Alzheimer's research for over 15 years now, and I believe the A4 study really does offer a new sense of hope. The A4 study is the first trial designed to prevent memory loss by identifying individuals who have the earliest changes of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, but don't yet have evidence of any symptoms. One of the earliest brain changes in Alzheimer's disease is the buildup of a protein called amyloid, and it forms plaques in the brain that occur probably 10 or 20 years before we get to the stage of very significant memory loss. This trial will test a specific investigational treatment that's designed to help the brain clear amyloid. <laughs> we understand the biology of Alzheimer's in a way we had never understood it before, and that the changes are occurring many, many years before the first day of forgetfulness. And so the idea is by treating before, we might be able to change the outcome later. This is so different from anything we've done before. This is taking people who don't have any memory problems and trying to prevent them from developing a disease that can affect your independence later in life. This finally gives us an opportunity to test the right target at the right time. We simply can't win this fight without help from everybody. We need 10,000 individuals between the ages of 65 to 85 to come in and screen for this study to find the 1,000 who are the perfect fit. We know that certain groups of people are at increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, so we need people from all walks of life. We have 60 sites in the US, Canada, and Australia. We hope to make it as easy as possible for people who are interested to come in and get screened for the study. Whatever the reason people choose to participate, we need help. We need people who want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. I suspect that many people will come because they've seen Alzheimer's disease in a loved one. Really? It robs people of what they've worked all their life to do. 
Once you've seen that, you really are very motivated to try to make sure that you personally will never have to deal with this uh, disease, either affecting you or affecting someone else you love. And ideally, that we defeat this disease before your children are at risk. We're on the cusp of breakthrough. It's really imperative that people understand that the time is now, the opportunity is now. We are the people who went to the moon. We can be the people who wipe out Alzheimer's disease. We will succeed, but we need your help. Join the A4 study. Now is the time. Now is the time. Ahora es el tiempo. Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. Okay, so, so yeah, so we really are on the cusp of testing these great, great uh, ideas and using this technology to really see, you know, can we prevent Alzheimer's disease? So, uh, <clears throat> so what can you do? So you can help us in a study, spread the word, support us financially. We've built everything from the ground up um, uh, in terms of uh, our operations, and be proactive. How can you be proactive? I think. Uh, uh, keep this in mind. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, so exercise and diet that's good for the heart is good for the brain. That's probably the best way that we can sum up what we, what we know or what we think we know about Alzheimer's prevention. And it's never too late. You know, our study showing that there appear to be some benefits to exercise in people with Alzheimer's disease says it's never too late to get these benefits. Shoot for 30 minutes of walking five days a week, but you don't have to achieve that to get the benefits, so don't let that hold you back if you're not getting to 30 minutes five days a week. And eat a heart-healthy diet, or there's a lot of research on the Mediterranean diet, so low in uh, red meats, high in nuts and olive oil and r red wine, one or two drinks a day. No more than that, though. Uh, and then sit less and move more, really. You know, sitting is the new smoking. Have you heard that phrase? I love that phrase. Um, we, we're learning that the more you, even if you get your 30 minutes a day, if you sit all day long, that's, uh, that's, that's going to set you back. So if you're sitting more than seven hours a day, without, especially without getting up and walking um, a little bit, uh, you know, during long stretches of sitting, uh, we're seeing higher, uh, higher risk for those individuals. So move more and consider it a day-long thing, not just a 30 minute. Mine, mine tends to be I'm trying to get my 30 minutes in, but we need to take a day-long approach and get some... Uh, some walking in throughout the day, uh, every commercial, try to get up, or while you're on the phone, try to pace around. Um, and don't forget that we see benefits even at the lowest dose of exercise. So we don't need to see people reach the threshold of 150 minutes a week, or if you get yourself a pedometer, you don't need to get to 10,000. We just want to see you increase. Um, although these are good goals. If you can get there, uh, there's more benefits at those levels, but there's still benefits at low doses. So, um, but we need your help. We need you to spread the word about what we're doing, be an advocate for Alzheimer's, be an advocate for research, um, participate in our studies if you're interested, and then, uh, and then support our, our research if you have the means, we, uh, or any, anyone's research if you have the means. Um, we do this uh, by basically uh, uh, fighting for the money one way or another through grants um, or um, working, trying to work with the companies that are producing these agents and we have to put it together piece by piece uh, to get where we're trying to go. So uh, any support is helpful. So, all right, I'm, uh, I'm gonna stop there and uh, Penny is uh, gonna join me up here and we're gonna sit and have questions and answers. Um, so thank you for your attention. written your cards out with your questions for Dr. Burns and now would be a good time to pass them to the aisles to the ushers and we will begin. Um, I have no financial arrangement with my Fitbit company <laughs> but I am glad I have one. So do we have, I have one question for you, um, Dr. Burns, that I have qu a question about. I have read that we can now grow Alzheimer's cells in the Petri dish. 
Of course, a petri dish and a mouse brain are not the same thing as a human brain, That's but right. um, do you see that as speeding up yeah. our research for medication, or all is it just too um, early too, to too tell? Far, too, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that is, so they made big news a couple months ago, the ability to grow these uh, cells in a petri dish that reflect the plaque and tangles um, of Alzheimer's disease, and it gives us a tool to take compounds that we think might help uh, fight that uh, and test them in the petri dish. So those types of tools speed up our ability to get drugs tested in people. You know, the step, you know, we like to show it works in mice or the cell models that we have. When we use those models to predict, would it be helpful in people? Yeah, the mouse brain is not the human brain. And we, we're, you know, so we have a, it's a big jump to go from the mouse to the human. And, um, and we're hoping that this new Petri dish, this way it was sort of framed in the press, uh, right. this new cellular model of Alzheimer's disease will help us more um, accurately predict what's going to work in people. Um, it's still early. Uh, so, you know, I, don't, I, I haven't heard of any, you know, concrete advances yet using that technique, but it is another, I think, hopefully powerful technique to help speed drug development. Thank you. I think we have a record in the number of questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's see. Could you speak a little more on genetics and Alzheimer's yeah. disease? Yeah, so genetics. So, you know, genetics definitely plays a role. Um, if it's in our family, our risk is higher. Uh, uh, you know, for 99% of the population, if it's in the family, your risk is higher and it's not a definitive, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an increase in your risk, but you won't, uh, you won't, you know, it's not inevitable that you'll get the disease. That's for 99%. If, you know, the new movie Still Alice is out, and I haven't seen it yet, but apparently it has a, an individual with early onset Alzheimer's disease who has a familial form of Alzheimer's disease, which is very rare, but you know, about one, less than 1% of people with Alzheimer's disease have a mutation in their genes that predicts whether or not they'll get the disease. And if they have that mutation, they will, without a doubt, get the disease. Um, so that's very, very rare. And when we see that, we tend to see early onset 40s and 50s um, of Alzheimer's disease in multiple generations. Uh, grandparents, parents, and, you know, brothers and sisters. Uh, when we see that pattern, we get worried about a familial form of Alzheimer's. But for the rest, you know, for the 99%, um, we, uh, it's more like you might think about heart disease, where if it's in the family, your risk is a little bit higher, but it doesn't mean you'll necessarily get the disease, uh, but your risk is a bit higher. And this is a, a really interesting question um, that we all kind of worry about um, when we talk about if you have the genes and what expresses them and turns them on, which, you know, might be the APOE4, whatever mm -hmm. gene we're talking about, do artificial sweeteners, such as those in Diet Coke, cause brain deterioration? I don't think our cardiologists definitely approve of them, but yeah. what's your take on those? Uh, I, I don't toxins? know of any evidence that links the, the artificial sweeteners with with memory loss. Um, so, you know, but environment, we're really, you know, the, the broader question of how does our environment and inflammation, you know, environment like diet exercise, which triggers things like inflammation, um, uh, how does that impact our risk? We think that does. Environment impacts our risk, and we're trying to understand how does environment work on the genes, on our genetic makeup to influence our risk. Um, those are difficult questions to answer, and it takes a lot of time, but we're really moving. The genetics field is really moving rapidly. We have somebody at KU, Robin Honey, who's working on uh, imaging genetics. She's trying to take the brain scan and, and genetic data, bring the two together to really understand how does uh, how do genetic and, and environment as well. How does our physical activity and our diet patterns sort of influence our genetic makeup and mm -hmm. our brain uh, health? So. Big questions that are hard to answer, but I think you know the next decade is going to bring a lot of answers in those answers. areas. Is there a connection between fluoride and aluminum in you know, the brain of people with Alzheimer's? So this is another one that we, we don't think so. 
I mean, really, so aluminum was something that 10, 15, 20 years ago was really, uh, you know, people were concerned about, but uh, that's pretty much been debunked. I remember when my grandmother threw out her aluminum, aluminum. cook pans in yeah. the 70s. Do yeah. y'all remember that? Not something that we think is true these days. So not, not, don't, don't worry about it. Or the aluminum in your uh, antiperspirant. <laughs> um, no worries. This is kind of an interesting question, and I, I think you will answer it well. But is there um, a relationship between right-handed or left-handed people and the impact on um, the percentage of people who have Alzheimer's? It, no, no, so not, or not in terms of risk. We neurologists always think about, are they right-handed or left-handed? Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and it's not for risk of something like Alzheimer's disease. It's because the language centers uh, are almost always in the left brain for right-handers, and about a third, only about a third of the time for a left-hander, they're on the right side. And uh, we kind of need to know that if somebody has a stroke or has damage to the brain, um, you know, when we're trying to figure out where the problem is, the right hand versus left hand can can be important information. Um, but in terms of Alzheimer's risk, you know, we don't we don't know of any um, any relationship. Right brain or left yeah. brain. Um, there is a difference, though, and I know we're having a, a workshop with KU's uh, program in June. Um, that Eric give you the okay, date. It's the Eric, 11th or the 12th. On the differences um, between men and women um, with onset and the progression. Yeah. So that will be here at the college this this summer because we are finding differences in the genders. Um, yeah. And it's not just because on average the, the, the women live longer. Right. I don't know why that is. Yeah, so yeah, so that'll be interesting, you know, looking at gender differences in, in Alzheimer's disease. And yeah, so women appear to get the disease, they live longer than men. Uh, and because they live longer than men, there's more women with Alzheimer's disease. But there also appears to be some evidence that the incidence, how frequent it's occurring in groups of women of equal age than men is a little bit higher. And we don't really know why that is. There's been theories about estrogen, um, uh, you know, implicating estrogen in, in Alzheimer's disease or some, you know, something about, uh, that, you know, differences across genders is, is probably driving that. It's really an interesting area. So we'll be exploring that in June here. And speak a little bit more about estrogen. Um, we used to think it was protective in yeah. perimenopausal, postmenopausal women, and now the research maybe is saying, mm, yep. can you speak to that? Yeah, so for the longest time we thought, you know, that uh, estrogen would, was helpful to the brain for all kinds of reasons. Uh, there's just a huge, uh, you know, well-established argument that estrogen would be good for the brain and perhaps prevent dementia. It was related to studies that were done on, observational studies that were done on hundreds and thousands of, of, uh, of women um, and found you know, evidence pointing to that there's a reduced risk of dementia. So what, what happened was eventually the money and the interest uh, uh, came together to test this idea in a randomized controlled trial um, where you know, half the women in the study got estrogen and the other half got a placebo. And the study was done, and, uh, and, and uh, surprise, uh, what we found was that the women getting estrogen were at slightly, but a real uh, higher risk uh, of developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease than the women who didn't get, who got the placebo. So estrogen is actually associated with a slight increase. It's small, but it's, but it's real. A slight increase of cardiovascular events, slight increase of stroke, and slight increase of dementia. Um, so that's why, that's the example that we give for why it's so important to test drugs in randomized controlled trials. We can't just rely on observational studies where we're looking at a thousand people and not, not really testing in a rigorous way um, by, you know, giving half a drug and the other half a fake drug that we can't tell the difference uh, between. Um, because really the only way to prove it beyond a doubt is through a randomized trial and that, that's, that's the big example. Same with vitamin E, I believe. Yeah. yeah, vitamin E too. So slight, again, so Go vitamin ahead. E, uh, very tiny but slight increase in risk of cardiovascular events. Um, 
and we've tested vitamin E in people with memory problems. And maybe some benefit, but tiny benefit, and probably not a benefit that outweighs this tiny increase in risk. So, because we used to, it used to be prescribed as used to give it to everybody at a high dose, at a very high dose. Yeah. What is the youngest age that of the person you've diagnosed Alzheimer's in? Alzheimer's, oh, in the, me personally, late 40s, although I've seen people with frontotemporal dementia in the, in the early 40s and other sort of very rare uh, neurodegenerative diseases, progressive supranuclear palsy, um, in somebody in their late 30s. Um, so we can see these, these sort of Alzheimer's or cousins of Alzheimer's at a young age. But that's, that's rare. Pretty rare. You know, the average age of onset is probably 70 to 75, um, although it's not uncommon to see it in people in their late 50s and the 60s, very common. Um, you know, and especially in a memory clinic like ours, um, we see it, you know, uh, at very young ages and then also, uh, but most commonly in the at late, what we call late onset Alzheimer's disease. And I know there's some relationship with mild traumatic brain injury being cumulative and the risks for developing a dementia later. Can yeah. you speak to that as well? Yeah, so, you know, traumatic brain injury, concussions, uh, major head injury, these are things that put people at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. We know that. Um, the risk isn't, isn't uh, you know, it's not huge, but it looks like it's, it's a real effect. Um, now, you know, it's, this isn't, the, you know, so if somebody maybe loses consciousness briefly, you know, very mild TBI, we don't, you know, one time, we don't consider that a big risk factor, but if we've had repeated hits to the head or major head injuries with loss of consciousness for sustained periods of time, those are uh, risk factors. They appear to set people up for some reason. We don't really know why, but set people up so that, you know, they're more likely to develop the memory problems that we ultimately call Alzheimer's disease. Um, so there's a lot of research in that area, a lot of it also in the area of you know, NFL, the traumatic brain injury, and, um, so sports-related injuries. Um, so that, you know, my opinion is, is you know, it's an enormous problem for the NFL and for every mom with a kid who wants to play football. Um, what do we do about that? And, uh, you know, so understanding how high that, you know, we need to understand better what that risk is. Um, I think it's very real, though, um, and, you know, and it's a big problem. So we need a lot of money going into that um, in terms of research to understand. You know, not everybody appears to be at risk for the dementia of, you know, that, that, that NFL players get. So understanding who's at higher risk and, and then defining that risk um, over a lifetime is something that really needs to be done. And, of course, the baby boomers are now going to be the generation that, you know, is at the beginning of the, the silver tsunami. Yes. You know, we're right offshore, and yeah. we're coming on board fast. Um, it, so I certainly want you to succeed in your research. Um, <laughs> but as, as our jobs become more sedentary, I worry about the next generation yeah. and the the sitting becoming the new yes. smoking. And I have colleagues here at the college who have the raised desks and they stand rather than sitting at the desk all day. Right. Is that going to help? I think it is. I mean, uh, I you know I think we need to think of the receptionist job. You know, eight hours a day sitting at, mm -hmm. behind the desk checking people in as a health hazard. I mean, you know, sitting all day long is not good for you. We know it, and it's been shown. So we need to, we need to, you know, I think there needs to be sort of a cultural shift uh, that recognizes that and then does something about it. So something as simple as, yeah, raising the desk helps. Putting a little treadmill underneath the desk so that somebody's walking a mile an hour, two miles an hour uh, while working is mm -hmm. something that, uh, we think would have an impact. Actually, I, my, I, when we get our next major grant, I'm going to get a treadmill desk. Um, so, uh, but I got to. We got to get that next major grant before I can justify doing that. Um, but yeah, I think I think th that's a that's a big problem, and the research is is really 
it's building in terms of showing it. Um, and we need to do something about it. We need to do more about it. So even after the boomers are through, our next generation who sits too much, yeah. it's still going to have a problem. Yeah. So that leads into this question about what countries have little or no Alzheimer's because maybe they are still in the fields um, and um, is the diet got anything to do with it? Um, can yeah. you speak to that? Yeah, so, I mean, those are there, are, there have been studies that look at the prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's across cultures. Um, and they tend to suggest that uh, the Western diet, the Western uh, lifestyle is, a, is associated with a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. So a couple studies I know, one was done in India and one was done in Nigeria and found lower, much lower prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's in those cultures. And, you know, the obvious implication is there's something about the lifestyle that, that's um, better in terms of brain health. Um, although those studies are far from definitive because it's really hard to, you know, go across cultures and we call it ascertainment bias. It's hard to ascertain dementia. It's hard to make that diagnosis in those cultures. There's big education differences. There's big occupational differences and lifespan differences lifespan differences and there's a lot of things that influence those results and so you know we don't necessarily know if it's it's a little harder to recognize early stages of dementia in those cultures or if it's truly a a reduction in the uh, in the risk we think we think it is but um, but it's hard to overcome those critiques of the study and what about sleep apnea so sleep sleep apnea is a risk factor for, okay. for dementia. Um, you know, sleep apnea is an individual can go years without sleep, uh, without good sleep, uh, and years waking up multiple times a night um, with low oxygen, and uh, that can take a toll. Um, so, you know, sleep apnea is something we pretty much think about in every patient that we see. Is it present, and are we doing everything we can to treat it? It's going to be very hard to treat. Not everybody, to a lot of people do not tolerate those masks. Um, but we just, we just have to, you know, try to stay vigilant and try to do everything we can to treat sleep apnea, at least detect it when it's, when it's, when it's there, and then mm -hmm. try to treat it to, to minimize its influence. Uh, but it is a risk factor, and, you know, understanding why it's a risk factor is not something that we, we uh, do very well right now. We don't, you know, is it the low oxygen levels um, or the poor sleep? You know, obviously, if we sleep poorly, we don't think quite as well the next day. Um, so what is it that's driving that long-term risk is unclear. Um, and there's a lot of research that's ongoing, actually, in that intersection between sleep and dementia. Because um, so. we're finding that the brain is doing so much at night that we, yeah. when it's asleep, that we did not know. Um, and I know very little about it, but it seems that the brain is defragging at night. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Throwing no, things out that it doesn't need. And sleep I think has a purpose. There is a purpose. Yes. We don't know what it is, but it has a purpose. Yeah. And uh, good sleep leads to better call it consolidation of memory. So mm -hmm. memory, if you're studying for a test and you sleep well, uh, uh, after you're studying, your memories are better sort of entrained in your brain than if you, say, study and don't get a lot of sleep. So I try mm -hmm. to tell my kids to sleep well, go to bed on time. They don't listen well, in the all-night study, yeah. it just isn't as good as studying and then going to sleep. Right. Yep. I wish I'd known that back then. <laughs> <laughs> With Alzheimer's more prevalent in the African American and the Latino population, um, how do you reach out um, to those populations and yeah. get? The, I, I can imagine that is a particular challenge to. To bring yeah. them in, it is, and it's something that we 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 work hard at, and it's very hard, um, you know, to to reach out and to get the trust and to get um, and to increase our recruitment of participants with uh, you know, African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, but it's something we're always working on. We actually have a, a satellite uh, presence in Swope Health Services, which is a safety net clinic in Kansas City, Missouri, um, to try to increase our. Uh, our recruitment of African Americans, mm -hmm. um, and this is a national problem. I mean, this uh, for yes. a lot of reasons, historical reasons. Um, 
cultural yep. reasons. And cultural reasons. Uh, and it's something that we're working on. Every meeting we go to, national meeting we go to, is uh, for the Alzheimer's centers, this is a discussion that, uh, that we have. It's what are we doing to, to get better representation of uh, minorities who are at higher risk for the disease, and we need to understand that better. And the results of our studies, what we worry about is how generalizable are the results. If we find something works, you know, if we find it works in a population that's 99% Caucasian, we don't necessarily know it's going to work in African Americans. Um, and so we need to, the studies, so that's why it's vital that our studies have a good representation of, of uh, you know, all groups so that we know it's results are generalizable to the to the population so big area of, big of area. discussion yeah and one last question um, what I know about the research dollars in this country um, with Alzheimer's actually costing us more in dollars um, than cancer and heart disease um, I believe I know that our research dollars are much less yeah. toward this disease than, than what we set aside for research into other diseases. And we've, um, so how do we um, get more politically proactive to our, our government and yeah. say, dear NIH, please, <laughs> please, um, put forward more research dollars to combat this illness and the good work you and the other Alzheimer's um, research centers are doing. Well, yeah, so I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean, that is a huge issue. Um, so Alzheimer's gets about $500 million a year in NIH dollars, uh, which sounds like a lot, but I, HIV gets about $6 billion, and I think cancer is... No. Mm -hmm eight to ten billion or something like mm -hmm. that so we're talking about a big difference um, and the 500 million is you know when you spread it across the whole country and all the people competing for these grants it's incredibly hard to get these grants we're funding right now about five percent of all applications to for the for the for uh, grants and that that's very very low it's basically we're getting down to you got to be uh, you got to be very lucky you got to be very, very good, and, and you got to be very, very lucky, um, because it's not coming down to you know, uh, not not necessarily coming down to the scientific question anymore. It's now luck, um, and you know we've been we've been very good and we've been very lucky, uh, I think, over the last ten years. But you know, every every year, ever since I started, people have told me that, you know, funding is bad. This is the worst year it's ever been, and but it's going to get better, and. Unfortunately, now I'm 12, 13 years in, and it's been the same thing every year. Uh, it hasn't been getting any better. Um, now, I do think there's hope for Alzheimer's. Now, other research areas, you know, I feel, feel they, they're in a worse situation, but Alzheimer's, there is some momentum, at least politically, um, and I think the awareness of Alzheimer's is, is uh, rising. And, um, we have seen small increases in the Alzheimer's research budget, $50 Obama million. Obama mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, there's been some, uh, some, mm -hmm. some relatively small, $50 million, last year $60 million, this year $50 million. And that makes a difference. And when you hear something like that, that money, we have a very good chance. That we're competing for that $50 million. That's real money that uh, will trickle down to us. Um, so what we want is $2 billion. Not, you know, we want a total of $2 billion a year. And we think that that's what we need to get to our goal of preventing the disease and treating it. Um, and our goal is to do that by 2025. Uh, so, uh, but we have a long way to go and we need the, we need the money. And we thank you for being there at, at the lead. So I think all that's right. all of our time. Thank you. Thank you.